It's a real pleasure to be here today to give this talk. It's a real pleasure to be back at uh, DTU. Um, I did my uh, master studies here back in the 1990s. And um, what I, I learned several things here, but one of the things I learned was that, that research and studies is not only about getting uh, wiser, but it's about uh, solving problems, it's about finding solutions, it's about uh, um, finding approaches, uh, devices, and so on. I did my final year in, um, in the US, uh, in uh, Milwaukee, at the Center of Great Lakes Studies. And um, when we did the first experiments where we didn't know the outcome of the experiment, then this was really where I got hooked on research. Before that, I was pretty sure that I wouldn't do research. But uh, when the experiments were in such a way that the supervisor didn't know the result, I thought, this is nice. I like it. <laughs> and um, then I came back for a year. I was here in, in, at DTU again as a, um, as a research assistant. And then I went to the Netherlands uh, to do my PhD. Um, and that was mainly on uh, analytical chemistry, environmental chemistry, environmental toxicology. And this was the time where I started with these partitioning-based methods you will hear more about today. And also I, I worked a lot with these hydrophobic organic chemicals. Then I was at uh, TNO, which is a, let's say, a big brother of uh, Dense Technologisk Institute in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, which was contract research for chemical industry. And then in 2001, I returned uh, to Denmark's Miljona Sölzer, which later became Aarhus University. And now I'm back here, and that, that's really nice. What I had on my way all the time was this um, um, idea that research is about also solving problems, is about finding solutions. And um, I think I had that with me all the time, but I also realized that um, the other places I've been, which are... Uh, more classical universities, and uh, they, they, of course, also had an influence on me. And some of the work I've been doing was actually rather fundamental. Um, and what I will do today is, rather than presenting the results of this fundamental research, I would like to go back. I would like to go back to the machinery of my research, because the, the findings that we had during the last years, they are very closely related to the techniques that we develop in the lab, and I would now like to show for the first time um, the partitioning-based laboratory. It goes beyond just techniques. It's a suite of techniques. And I think we start seeing the picture of that they can form a new uh, research platform. Thank you very much, Stefan, for the nice introduction. <laughs> And, um, and that is because we share very much the same context. We are talking about organic chemicals, about the risk, and about the research that is needed to, um, to um, regulate them. And what is really central in my research is the word exposure and also determining exposure. And determining here has several meanings. So some of the research is related to defining exposure. Some of it is related to how we measure exposure. And some of it is related to how we control exposure um, in the experiment, but also out in the environment when we um, manage uh, pollution. And uh, we tried to make a very complementary program for you today. So you heard a lot about the ionizable compounds. I will talk about the hydrophobic organic chemicals. Uh, these are nonpolar compounds. They sorb and bind to soils, to sediments. They also partition into the lipids of organisms. And uh, what makes them very special is that partitioning. So I put the plant over there, but I left the partitioning here. Because the partitioning is really what rules in my presentation. Um, the partitioning can mean that a very low concentration in air or in water becomes a very high concentration at the target site, which often is a membrane so that we have to worry also about very low concentrations. And I again have to go back to Paracelsius. <laughs> at my last inaugural lecture at Aarhus University, I, I offended him. I said that he got it wrong. It's the chemical activity that makes the poison. Um, and he is actually right. Um, it was 
it, it, this is very important. He, it's more than 500 years ago, and he introduced the idea that it's really a question of the level. All substances are poisons. There is none which is not a poison. The right dose differentiates a poison. But this dose, this is something you can do research about for years, because how do you, def how do you define the dose? And Henrik from, Henrik Tulle from uh, uh, the Danish EPA here already uh, addressed this. This is a, a major issue, and we will come a little bit closer to that. Because there's an alternative to dose, and that is partitioning. So if you are concerned about a human eating something, it makes very good sense to focus on the dose. You're interested in how much can you eat before it gets a problem. But if you are in a fish or another animal out in the environment, there will be several uptake routes. You will have exposure via the oral uptake route. You can have inhalation. You can have dermal contact. And uh, it's not so easy to define the dose. And for the compounds I work with, and these are hydrophobic organic chemicals, um, this really makes very good sense. This is the work of Charles Ernest Overton and Horst Meyer, and they introduced for more than 100 years ago narcosis. And um, what they saw was that there's a reversible partitioning process of compounds from water and air into the organism, and more specific, into the membranes, that leads to toxicity, that this process is reversible. So when the exposure is on, you have uptake and toxicity. If you take away the exposure, the compounds can also be released again. And he saw that, or they saw that exposure can be both through air and through water, and that the concentrations outside the organism can vary greatly that gives toxicity, whereas the concentration that gives toxicity on an internal basis is actually very similar between the compounds. Now the beauty of this is that if partitioning is controlling the uptake and is the governing processes, then we can apply physical chemistry. And then these guys are coming into the play. Gips, who introduced the Gips free energy, and Louis, who introduced fugacity. And these are basically concepts of chemical potential, fugacity, and activity as equilibrium criteria. Sometimes we use them to predict an equilibrium situation. Sometimes we use them as a reference, because even if you have a dynamic system, the different spontaneous processes that thrive towards this uh, equilibrium situation. For hydrophobic organic chemicals, so I'm talking about compounds like PCBs, PIHs, um, brominated frame retardants, and, and, and such compounds, we have found out that a very good way to look at this is chemical activity, and um, more specifically, the unitless chemical activity. And um, it's the energetic state relative to the pure liquid and it's defined between zero and one. And, and uh, you might say, ooh, this sounds very uh, complicated. But if I would ask you, or if I would define for you how temperature is defined, it would be as complicated. The thing is, this has many similarities to temperature, as you will see in a minute. And it's actually not very difficult when you are used to it. It's the energetic state relative to the pure liquid. The liquid has a chemical activity of one which means saturation, and zero means that there's no chemical activity. So this is the range. So if we talk about a liquid, you can go from zero to one. If we talk about a solid, it will crystallize. So you come from a low chemical activity, you go up, and then the chemical activity of the crystal state will determine how high you can come. And this is very important, as you will see later, because some compounds, they will form crystals before they get toxic. They cannot reach the chemical activity that is required to have toxicity. Diffusion, partitioning, and reactions always go from high to low chemical activity, and you would say, but this also holds for concentrations. It does, but only in a homogeneous medium. If you are in a heterogeneous environment, and this is the normal situation in, in environmental science, or you are at interfaces, partitioning and diffusion goes from high to low chemical activity, but not necessarily from high to low concentration. It is proportional to C3, and very often we express our results on a freely dissolved concentration basis, 
it's the concentration of unbound compounds. And this is very well established in medicine, in pharmacology, and so on, and there's nothing wrong with it, as long you don't see it as the pool of available molecules. Because the, the pool, in, in terms of mass, this freely dissolved concentration represents hardly anything. It's very, very little. But when looking at it as an effective concentration, it works fine. Fugacity is another way, uh, which is the escaping tendency into air, uh, and works very well for volatile compounds. Now, one of the reasons that this works is that equilibrium, we have the same chemical activity, for instance, in sediment, as in interstitial water, as in, in the worm. This is a very simple but also very powerful equation, and a very general one, that when you are in equilibrium, you can transfer from one compartment to the other. And you're all doing this in a different arena. So if you, um, if you buy something in the shop, you put it in the freezer, you know the next day the temperature is minus 18 degrees, simply because when you have given it enough time, then the temperature is the same in the freezer as in the, in the, um, um, in the thing you put in, into the freezer. And it's the same principle we use for our predictions. Okay, why chemical activity? Because it's the controlling entity for that, that quantifies the potential for uh, processes. And these are processes like diffusion, partitioning, reactions. It determines the equilibrium partition concentrations in, in other media, for instance, in the lipids of an, a small organism that lives in soil. It also determines the direction and the extent of diffusion between media. So if you're measuring the chemical activity in sediment, of a harbor and in the water, and the chemical activity is higher in the sediment, you know that the diffusion is from the sediment to the water, meaning that it is a diffusive source. There are two analogies. One is for temperature. The other one is actually stronger. It's water activity that is very well established in food science. And water activity is actually the chemical activity of water. You have the same scale. 0 to 1, or 0 to 100 percent relative humidity. So it is a percentage of how close you are to the saturation level. And that is another way to express chemical activity. Okay. And finally, it's the, the toxicological data that we found in the literature convinced us that this was a good way to go. So um, what you're looking here on the left side are uh, effect, effective concentration, meaning the concentrations that give toxicity for three different studies. This is the Overton study from 1899. And here tadpoles were exposed to alcohols. And since there were different alcohols used, you also have different concentrations that give a toxicity. This is a study from Ferguson 50 years ago. And he looked at mice that were exposed to volatile compounds via, the, um, via air. And uh, here he found other effective concentrations in air. And finally, some ecotox data for hydrophobic chemicals, where we look at the toxicity to algal growth, inhibition of algal growth. So if you look at these data, and all data here are on a molar basis. So this is the molar concentration that gives toxicity. And not very surprisingly, you see a huge range. You ha have some range within the studies and a much larger range between the studies. If you now transfer this to the chemical activity notation, and we do that by going over here, we see, and this is just done with a spreadsheet, so it's just calculations. We see that all data sets, they collapse to a smaller range, and also that the total um, range is much smaller. In general, we see toxicity at 0.01 to 0.1, or 1% to 10% of saturation, which is in good correspondence with um, existing um, toxicological principles and theories. And this was for us the starting point, and I think we have to go back about eight years to, um, to work with these partitioning-based methods in a more systematic way, and um, what we needed was 
you needed methods that could measure chemical activity and other parameters, bioavailability parameters. We needed experimental systems to control chemical activity. And also we wanted to generate chemical activity gradients for specific studies. So this is the context for the development of a, of a huge range of methods, and some of them I will uh, show to you in a, in a, in a second. And uh, what is specific about these uh, methods is that partitioning in these methods is not just something we're looking at, but partitioning is something we're using. It's part of the machinery. It's the way the, the machine works, it's the way the method works. And you can do this in many different ways, and it's very important after you have had an idea that you are using good criteria to select the right methods and that you go for the right methods and, and that you optimize them in the, in the right way. And we, ha we use these three criteria, KISS, keep it simple, stupid, very, very important. And that is because so far it has shown that the most simple methods are the ones that also work best in our hands. High performance added value, it's not good enough to develop a method if it doesn't give added value, if it doesn't give added performance. And finally, this is a very specific research context that I explained to you in a second, of a second ago. So we want to develop methods that are much more broadly applicable. And I hope I can convince you about that now. So let's start with the analytical work. The normal way to do analytical work, to do sampling in the laboratory is not based on partitioning. The classical way to extract compounds, which actually is the determining step of what you measure in the laboratory. M many people focus very much on the instrument, but it's actually the work before the instrument that determines what you measure. And the classical way to do that is to say, if we have a sample, it might sometimes make sense to divide the compounds you look at into something that is weakly bound, that is in the freely dissolved form, and that is in a irreversible bound form, in a strongly bound form. And when you do conventional analytical chemistry, your job is to get everything. And everything is allowed. You can use strong solvents, you can use a lot of solvents, you can use heat, radiation, and so on. So you use maybe half a liter of solvent to get all the compounds into an extract. You will also take a lot of other compounds into the extract. And then there will be a lot of work up. Very well established. It's the backbone of our research. There's nothing wrong with it. This is the way, the normal way to do it. Then there's a different way to do it. And this different way is shown here. In this, in this case, we are placing a thin polymer and equilibrate it with the reversible bound and the freely dissolved. Initially, people said it's only equilibrating with the freely dissolved, but this actually doesn't make sense. It's the same as with a the thermometer. Um, you don't know from where the heat came into the thermometer. You're just equilibrating. When you have equilibrium, you measure the concentration in the polymer, and then you can translate that to very, very important uh, parameters. These are the freely dissolved concentrations, which is a well-accepted uh, parameter in toxicology as the effective concentration. You can translate it to the chemical activity, and we can also project from the polymer into other media, and there the most interesting are the membranes of the body, which is the toxic target. So we can project from the silicone to the membranes under an equilibrium assumption. So we can basically say that if the membranes are in equilibrium with this sample, then the concentration will be this. Equilibrium sampling is a, is a kind of passive sampling, and many people have probably heard about passive sampling, which basically applies a polymer or a solvent that you put out in the environment and then you have an increase of the concentration in time. Initially, it's a kinetic, it's a linear kinetic, and then in some cases you can get it into equilibrium. Most passive sampling is happening here. Our passive sampling is here. So we wait until there's equilibrium. This all started 15 years ago when we started putting SPME fibers, and we call them SPME because it's the technique from where we came was solid phase microextraction. In fact, these are optical fibers that are used for data transmission. So they look like this. So for the people doing data transmission, the important part is the glass. 
And uh, what we use is just the very, very thin silicone coating we have around it of 50 micrometer. So we start placing these fibers into sediment, into soil, into sludge, and waited until there was equilibrium. The next step was to measure the concentration. Initially, it was done almost like this, that we simply put the fiber into the GC. There was some resistance from the analytical chemist, but uh, actually the chromatograms, they look very nice. Um, and then the compounds, they were thermally dissolved, separated on the GC, and measured. In that way, we get the concentration in the PDMS, and we can then translate that to freely dissolved concentrations and chemical activities. A more modern method, and this is one of the methods we will set up here at uh, DTU. Uh, luckily, we have the right uh, GCs and the right out samplers for that. It's a method that was um, uh, developed by Charlotte Leggin uh, in our group, or she was PhD actually here at DTU, but she worked, no, she, she, was a, she was a PhD in our department, but went then to DTU afterwards. So that's the, as you know her, some of you. Um, so the principle here is that you uh, can put a sample, a solid sample, into a, a vial and put the f an outer sample, we put a fiber above the sample and you will then have a three-phase equilibrium. You, you will equilibrate the fiber through the air with the sample. And this is just to tell you that you have to start somewhere and then suddenly you can actually do things fully automated and for the for the volatile compounds, it, it is possible to do this in a fully automated way. The last method I showed you works best for volatile compounds. Many of the compounds we work with are not so volatile. And the best method we have right now is then the coated jars. They were uh, developed by Frederick Reichenberg uh, together with me. And um, the principle is here that we apply a very thin silicone coating on the vertical sides of a glass. They are in the order of uh, micrometer. And uh, we normally use a range of thicknesses, one to eight micrometer, for instance. Again, the compounds can now partition between the soil, for instance, and the PDMS. And it's the same. We wait until there's equilibrium. And then we can remove the soil. We can measure the concentration in a polymer. And uh, here you see some results from a collaboration partner in uh, Sweden. They apply this to, um, to the Baltic Sea and to sediment in the Baltic Sea. And um, th there is a reason why this has very high performance analytically. And this is, if we look at, this was a study for PCBs. The concentration in the water will be amplified by the partition coefficient when we go from the water and into the silicone. So the concentration in the silicone will be 10 to the 6 higher when we go from water into silicone. And that means that a concentration of 1 picogram per liter becomes a concentration of 1 microgram per liter in the polymer, and we have a very strong amplification. If you combine this with uh, high-end analytical equipment, you can use this technique down to the femtogram per liter range. And also, we have very high precision and uh, good possibilities for QA and uh, QC. Here you get an idea how we apply these methods. So we equilibrate the silicone with the sediment and measure this concentration in the silicone. We can then relate it to the lipid-based concentrations in the fish and use that to see whether the fish is in equilibrium, under equilibrium, or over equilibrium relative to the sediment. We can also tr translate to the freely dissolved concentration, which is the effective concentration for many environmental processes. And we can then compare this freely dissolved concentration with the aqueous concentration, the overlaying water, finding out how are the dynamics, what is the direction of mass transfer. And here an example of results. So uh, we're looking for three PCBs, PCB 28, 153, 180. We're looking at the freely dissolved concentration as a function of the distance to Stockholm Harbor. And even though the concentrations are picogram per liter, it was not a problem to, to measure this gradient. And it shows that there is still a gradient of these PCBs, even though PCBs have been banned for 30, 40 years ago. So there is still emission, and some of the gradient is still uh, conserved 
but we are not saying that there's a very high source strength. Uh, but, but we can still pick up these uh, gradients. These are some of the other methods um, that can be developed. And this is work that we did together with uh, Jan Oke Jansson, who is also here today. And um, here we applied it to uh, membrane extraction technology. And then you can actually use this also for more polar compounds. This is a, a porous polypropylene membrane. Uh, these are silicone microtubes. And uh, these are also silicone microtubes together with roots. And you can apply and play with them in, in different ways. The last one, you can put them into soil systems to see what happens in the root area. And finally, as mentioned earlier, what really matters is the internal exposure. So uh, a de an, another development is actually to measure in the tissue. In our lab, we have done uh, this on dead tissue. In other groups, uh, people are actually applying it also to animals. You might say, is it really necessary to put a small needle into a fish? Uh, that is a, is a reasonable question. Um, actually, the motivation to do this was to save animals. Because if you are able to monitor the increase of the internal concentration in time, you can get the bioaccumulation kinetics with less animals. So there was a very good reason why to do that. Um, but so far, we haven't done it yet. We have done it on, on just on tissue. And finally, you probably in the newspapers, you have read a lot about uh, PCBs in schools and in institutions. And right now, we are hearing that it's not just institutions. It's also family houses. It's a big issue. Um, and um, for the Danish Energy Agency, we were trying to f find a way how we could screen for PCBs in, in houses. Because uh, there are many, uh, many techniques, it's very easy to, to measure, but of course it's a little bit costly. Uh, so we were asked, could, could you somehow come up with a method where you can screen and find out in this house there is a problem and you should do more investigations. We tried different things, kinetic sampling, and when I say we, this is um, from my former uh, institute and uh, Katrin Forkamp, uh, we, we collaborate on this. Um, and first we did kinetic sampling, which is the conventional way. And right now we are trying uh, to do equilibrium sampling. And uh, the best format right now seems to be a baking paper. So you can find some baking paper that is made out of cellulose but has very thin silicone coatings on both sides. And the idea is to put it in the room for one or two days. Then you can put it into the envelope, send it to the laboratory and do the measurement. Uh, there's a screening side to that. That is with regards to converting it to air concentrations. There's a scientific point to this, and that is you can then translate the concentration in the silicone using an equilibrium assumption into lipids. And then you can have a look and say, OK, what is the concentration in lipid if it was in equilibrium with this room? Now, if the body, if the body levels are higher, it means that there is no diffusion from the room into the body. It's actually there's a release situation. And that would be when... The compound is mainly taken up by the food, by a fish that are contaminated, we know that, and where you actually are above the thermodynamic equilibrium of the houses. And I think with these techniques we get a new thermodynamic handle on these processes. I would like to say this very shortly. I talked a lot about chemical activity as just one exposure parameter. There's another one which is also very important. If you are interested in soil pollution, and you worry about that there's a child eating the soil, the chemical activity is not very important. What is important is how much of the soil can actually be released when the soil is entering the digestive system. And then we talk about bioaccessibility. It's a little bit the two dimensions. You have the, the thermodynamic level and you have the mass that can be released. And um, in a recent project, we wanted to measure it and we found out then that the methods available are not working for these very hydrophobic chemicals, at least not when you look at historic pollution. And the reason is that in bioaccessibility extractions, what you do is you take a small soil sample and you put it into a solution that mimics the conditions you're interested in. For instance, the digestive fluid. But the systems were made for other compounds, especially for metals. And what happens is that the compounds are released initially, 
And people are very careful that you mimic the solution in the right way, the right pH, and so on. But then after some time, this option stops because the system equilibrates. And it simply equilibrates because there's not enough solution to diffuse into. And in the real situation, you don't have it. The child eats the soil, the compounds are released, but there's also something continuously pulling and taking away the, the mobilized compounds. So what we did here is that we placed, we started playing, uh, placing an absorption sink into the system so that we both have the dissolution but we also have the absorption. The job is not, or the task here is not to mimic the absorption. We're not trying to make um, a, a mimic of a, of a child eating the soil, but we just want to make sure that we get everything off that is able to diffuse uh, out in the, into the solution under these conditions. Here a range of different methods for different uh, purposes and I think most important is that this really matters. You look here at a so-called cyclodextrin extraction that is a, uh, a method that was published for more than 10 years. It's used a lot. There are contract labs running this method and um, we used it on, on wood soot. So this is soot from a wood burning stove and it's relevant because uh, the pyrogenic particles that come out of the wood stove and other sources, they are loading the soil by deposition. If we put this wood soot into a normal cyclodextrin extraction, just a dissolution experiment, we get a fraction in the order of maybe 5% up to maybe 20%. That is how much is released. But if we put a silicone sink in there that continuously uh, absorbs, then under the same condition we can increase that to 60 to 70 percent. And I think it's really important because before you are starting using bioavailability parameters into risk assessment, you really need to be sure that you get the bioavailability right. I mean you make the, the system less conservative and then you're also obliged to make it in a correct way. And I think that in this area you really need to, to be uh, rather careful. So, so much about the analytics. I would now like to move to uh, the opposite direction. No, I would like to, um, to conclude on this. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, with partitioning-based sampling, uh, we can have precise measurements at ultra-trace levels down to the femtogram to picogram per liter range. Uh, I think most important is that we can get some new thermodynamic insights. Um, and so far we have seen that chemical activity often is higher in sediment than in water. Also we have seen that biota often is under-equilibrated relative to sediment, which was surprising. But what about humans and buildings? I think that, that is one of the next questions. We also have seen that there's very limited exposure of strongly bound pHs. So this, this um, uh, supports the idea that if you can remove the mobile part and you can remove the available part and there's something left that is strongly bound then the exposure will be less and the risk will be less and it might be an acceptable situation. And finally we have seen that including assorptive sink and bioaccessibility extractions is simple and leads to higher and more correct estimates. Now I would like to use to uh, move to passive dosing. Passive dosing is a newer technique. Uh, it started in 1999 uh, during my PhD in Utrecht. And in passive dosing, we're doing the opposite. Now the compound starts to be in the polymer and we use it to tightly control the exposure in an experiment. We can use it for various types of in vivo testing. This could be fish tests, fish egg tests, algae tests, uh, small crustacean tests and so on. But increasingly also it's used in in vitro testing with cell lines and with bacteria. I put a humidor here for cigars and that's because there are many similarities. That the, the way the humidor works is that you have oasis foam that is wetted and this works as a partitioning source to control the humidity in that box. And this is also how passive dosing works. So if we, if we, dig, if we go down into one of these wells of a plastic uh, well plate, um, such a well, 
Then we have in the center the freely dissolved molecules, the unbound molecules. And that is because we see these, the, 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 the freely dissolved concentration as the effective concentration. Then there are a number of loss processes. You have binding to the medium, sorption to the vessel, evaporation, um, interaction with what you're studying, uptake, metabolism, and so on. And this can lead to that you have, uh, 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 not a little bit, but in some cases, a dramatic decreases of exposure. And often you don't know which exposure you should relate your uh, toxicity observation. With passive dosing, we add one more process, which is uh, silicone with the compound. And we make partitioning the dominating process. So this is used as a donor. And by equilibrium partitioning, we can tightly control this freely dissolved concentration. We control C free and not C total. We, are, we get defined and constant C free. We don't introduce a solvent, which is the normal way, which, and it also has analytical advantages. I could talk about passive dosing for quite some time. We have uh, done a lot of work in the last years. I would like to give you some highlights of the results. Here we are looking at toxicity data for 10 PAHs. PAHs are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so these are a number of benzene rings connected, put together. And um, in this case, we uh, tested each of these compounds only at one level, which is the saturation level. It's the maximum exposure level. So if we, if we start with this test here, it's done with Daphnia magna, which is a crustacean. It's a small uh, water flea. And we are looking at acute toxicity within 48 hours. Each of the symbols is one compound. And let's have a look at the axis. We have the chemical activity scale here. One means saturated with regards to the liquid state. So if we would have tested a liquid, we would have observations here. These compounds are not liquids, they're solids. So um, the first compounds we have is naphthalene, which is low melting, and it has a chemical activity, maximum chemical activity of 0.3. And then with increasing uh, melting point, we are going in this direction. And some of the news here is that um, whether a compound can be toxic or not toxic in this setting highly depends on uh, how stable the crystals are. So that's where the thermodynamics come in again. And very interesting, interestingly, we have phenantrine here, which is a three ring pHs over one corner, whereas we have anthracene down here, which is also three ring pH, but straight. They have almost, in all respects, the same properties. Same diffusion coefficient, same partition coefficient, same molecular weight, and so on. The big difference is that the one that is straight makes more stable crystals, and that means that they start crystallizing at a lower level, and therefore it is not possible to get into the toxic range. When we use chemical activity, we can also um, compare toxicity data from different media, because this is a multimedia parameter. So this is an aquatic test, and this is a test with soil, or with a soil organism at least. Um, it's done with a springtail, it's called a springhale, and you see a very similar dose response curve. And that's because it's the same process. And with chemical activity, we are able now to compare organisms that live in different compartments. The main observations here, toxicity within the expected range of what I showed you earlier, one to 10% of saturation, we have one dose response curve for 10 chemicals, more or less. And also we can compare organisms that live in different compartments. Maybe the most important perspective of this is that we can move now to mixtures. Because if this is the picture, then we would expect that the mixture toxicity, this type of mixture toxicity, would be well related to the sum of chemical activities. And we have done research, Stine Norga Schmidt is here today, she has done some research on that, showing that. And I would like just to show one uh, result, which I think is the most interesting. And that is, when we are, not when, when we are looking at the compounds that were not toxic when tested individually, 
because this is really creating problems, this, this study, I think. So um, the high melting compounds will not have a sufficient chemical activity to cause toxicity by itself. But if you put a number of them together, then thermodynamics would say the solubility should, um, they, they, they will be additive, and in total you can reach a higher exposure, and maybe also a toxicity. And this is exactly what we saw, that uh, baseline toxic mixtures of non-toxic chemicals. And th this creates a problem. So in a regulatory setting, you are determining, you're testing the toxicity of a hydrophobic chemical. The industry is really happy, there's no toxicity, but somehow the job is not done yet because the compounds might still uh, contribute to the mixture toxicity. This also goes beyond baseline toxicity and beyond a normal acute toxicity. In this case here, it was applied to an AIMS-2 test, so it's about mutagenicity. And what we see here, here are the toxicity data for uh, solvent spiking, so the conventional way to do it, and then with passive dosing here. Uh, for the solvent spiking, toxicity is related to the nominal concentration, the added concentration here, it's related to the freely dissolved concentration, and you can see quite a shift in the dose response curve. Um, and also that uh, the tests agree better between, uh, uh, between the runs. And finally, and also a little bit unexpected, we saw that passive dosing also can be used for analytical purposes. Um, and this is because with passive dosing you can control the freely dissolved concentration and then you can measure the total concentration. And the ratio between the total and the freely dissolved concentration yields a very important information about binding. So we can determine the free fraction of the sample. We can determine the enhanced capacity of a media relative to water, for instance, when we're looking at transport of soil pollutants down to the groundwater. And we can also determine binding constants. A nice application area are nanoparticles, binding of pHs to nanoparticles, maybe even in very difficult matrices like the, the, ju the, the fluids that you have in, in the lungs. This is a study from, um, uh, from the US um, where they applied our passive dosing technique uh, to look at, at binding of uh, pHs to nanoparticles. So passive dosing gives new possibilities and findings. It can provide well-defined and constant exposure without the addition of co-solvents. Baseline toxicity initiates at a relatively narrow band. This can also be used as a reference. So if you find toxicity below this band, this is a very good indication that you have more than baseline toxicity, that you have a specific mode of action, that you have reactive toxicity. Compounds without individual toxicity can form toxic mixtures, and there's also an analytical side to this. And finally, I would like to combine the two things. So the first story was about getting the compounds into the polymer. This was analytical work. Then it was about using the polymer as a donor. And now we put this together, and we sometimes call this pull-push systems. This is a rather small system, maybe this is five millimeters or eight millimeters. Uh, up here. Um, and what we're doing here is that we load a silicone disc with our compounds. This is the source disc. And then we put a clean disc in very, close con on in, uh, very close to it. And using a simple washer with a thickness of 100 micrometer, we can separate them. And now we can vary the medium we have in between. We have tried this with air, with water, with digestive fluids, with um, exudates from plants, um, many different fluids. And what we are then looking at is how the compounds, they move from the source to the sink. Because it's very easy to measure the concentration that builds up in the sink. Actually, this was a collaboration with Stefan Trapp. He did some of the modeling. This is a differential equation. And then we do the measurements and we fit it to this function. And what you see here is that when we put solutions there with different concentrations of humic acids, which is a model dissolved organic carbon in the environment, 
then we can have an increase in mass transfer because the rate constant here from these equations, it increases at least for the most hydrophobic compounds. So for instance, for benzipyrin, whereas for naphthalene, we have hardly any effect. What is the significance of this? Normally, we see binding of compounds as something that reduces mobility, that reduces uptake. But if you're on a dynamic system and your mass transfer, your uptake is limited by diffusion through a boundary layer, then actually DOC and the binding to DOC can be um, something that helps the mass transfer, that acts as a co-vector. Uh, and finally, this also applies to uh, microorganisms. This is very, very recent work by Dorothea Gilbert, uh, and she did this during her master thesis. She's now a PhD student, um, employed at my former institute, but enrolled at DTU, DTU Food. And uh, what she did was uh, she put such a pull push, pull push system under the microscope. This is an object glass, a special object glass where we look from the side. It's called a Dunn chamber. And there is an annual ring, an outer annual ring, and an inner annual ring. In the outer ring, we have a zero concentration, in this case maintained by a clean O-ring that we place there. In the inner ring, inner well, we have the, the high concentration, and that is maintained by a loaded O-ring. And what happens then is that since this is the bottleneck for the mass transfer, that here we have a well-defined constant and linear gradient building up. It's a gradient in chemical activity. This can be used to study how microorganisms behave in chemical activity gradients. But here we are looking at the opposite, and that is how the organisms and the movement of the organisms affects the mass transfer. And this is what Dorothea observed. So if she puts tetrahumina puriformis or tüffeldür into the system. Then she sees the following. The, compound, the, the organisms, they move around here by random movement. When they are close to the source, they will take up the compound. And by random movement, they will also go to the other side and then release it. And on the right-hand side, we look at the enhancement factor in mass transfer, and we see that for naphthalene, there's only a small enhancement, but with increasing hydrophobicity, we have an increase up to 100-fold, almost 100-fold in mass transfer. So microorganisms are not just degrading, they're actually also transporting the compounds on the microscale when we go into such systems. The coming years. I would like to build a partitioning-based laboratory at DTU. And uh, this is um, useful in analytical chemistry, environmental chemistry, and environmental toxicology. I expect that there will be new applications and combinations simply because it's a new institute, new themes. And I also hope to extend to more chemicals. Um, I think that we will see um, that things will move towards applications within environmental technology. So some of the techniques I showed you here, they will move from fundamental research to that we look into the wastewater treatment plant and so on. And eventually, maybe even that partitioning is not just an environmental process, and it's not just something that we can use in the laboratory, but it's maybe also something that we can put at use to clean up and to use in environmental technology. And I also hope that, um, that this is a platform suited for teaching and supervision of students. With that, I would like to acknowledge the funding from uh, Danish and Swedish research councils from the EU, um, also from industrial sources. I would like to thank very much the group members, Kilian, Barbara, Lars, Charlotte, Frederik, Ulrich, Peter, Yannick, Margit, Stine, Annegrete and Dorothea, and also many research partners. And eventually I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope that you get an idea that we are on the way to have the partitioning-based laboratory. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>